FHOA recalled and removed our tyrannical HOA board. This is the account of how we fought and ultimately prevailed in our long-running battle with an out-of-control HOA board. Part 1 So, what does it mean when it says that a house isn't an HOA? We naively asked the real estate agent at the newly built community that we were looking at back in 1998 in Arizona. My wife and I had both grown up in northern New Jersey, not far from NYC. This is an old section of an old state that's already been pretty well built up, and since the houses are all largely pre-1980s, there really aren't any HOAs there. We also lived in New York about an hour out of NYC, and since this was all farm country, there weren't any HOAs there at the time either. Neither of us had, well, ever heard of such a thing. So the agent quickly just glossed over it, basically just selling us on how great HOAs are for property values and how they made sure that all of the houses were well maintained. Previously, we lived in New Jersey. You would occasionally come across like that one house in the neighborhood that just stood out like a sore thumb. Like foot high weeds, junky cars, trash everywhere, broken windows, and typically a hand scrawled sign hanging on the front of the house going off on either a religious rant or seething about whoever happened to be president at the time. We certainly weren't going to be one of those people, and if living in an HOA prevented that, then, well, hey, maybe it won't be that bad after all. Well, it didn't take too long after moving in to see where living in an HOA could begin to become a problem when we received a violation notice for putting out our garbage cans 30 minutes too early. Now, pickup was on Monday, so the cans could not go out before noon on Sunday. While the board didn't do anything illegal during the time that we lived there, we soon found out that they were obsessed with enforcing the rules to the very letter. To illustrate how fixated with it they were, several years later, I received another violation letter, this time for putting our garbage cans out two minutes too early. In this instance, I was heading out the door and looking at the clock, I saw that it was 11.55 a.m. I figured, eh, close enough. By the time that I get outside, I unlock the gate, I get the cans out to the curb, it should be 11.57 or 58. Two days later was when I received the violation letter, so apparently they had someone literally patrolling the neighborhood at exactly noon looking for violators. They also had very specific landscaping rules that they also fanatically enforced as well. There was a list of approved and disallowed plantings and exactly how many of each that you could have and how many you must have. If one died, you had to replace it with one from the approved list. If something sprouted on its own, that meant that you now had one too many, and one had to go. One day, some new people moved in, and apparently, having never lived in an HOA before, they must not have read the rules too closely, because they extensively landscaped the front yard without getting approval. It looked great when they were done. They had the nicest looking front yard in the whole development. The problem was that they put in plants on the disallowed list, and far too many plants overall the HOA made them take it all out, even though they had substantially improved the appearance of their property and had enhanced the property value, the board's official policy of the rules are the rules meant that they didn't have much other option illustrating that it's less about property values and more about conformity, control, and punishing violators. Ticked off about the whole thing, they took a scorched earth response in protest and ripped literally every single plant out of the yard. The one tree that was left had every branch cut off. It looked like a bomb had gone off. Well, now they were in trouble for not having enough plants in their yard and they begrudgingly had to put in the bare minimum and moved away shortly thereafter. We lived there for eight years. The house was your typical cheaply built new build that all are too common in Arizona since they lowered the building codes in the late 80s. Wanting something nicer and specifically better built, we started looking for another house. The first thing that we told our agent was, no HOAs. After living in one for eight years, we had had our fill of them. If only we had stuck to our guns, we could have avoided a ton of aggravation. So we started looking and we came across a house that we really liked. The issue was, of course, that it wasn't an HOA, but the agent assured us that it was a good one, not at all like the last one that we lived in, and he had a point. This development was built in the early 80s, so the CCNRs were rather condensed. 
The use restrictions were all of two pages and were essentially the same as the city municipal blight codes. Of course, there was the usual, garbage cans must be stored out of sight, no livestock and so on, but really nothing objectionable. Little did we know that in previous years, the entire board had had to be removed and that there had been two earlier lawsuits as well, all of which we were unaware of. So we bought it, and honestly, for the better part of eight years, it looked like the agent was right after all. This was the rare benign HOA. There were no amenities, very little common area, just a few end caps, and association fees were low, like 38 bucks a month. It made it easy to forget that you were actually living in an HOA. Subsequently, homeowner apathy was rampant. There were a fair number of rental units and snowbirds, both of which were totally checked out and uninvolved. Nobody ever went to any of the HOA meetings or paid any attention to what was going on, myself included, which opened the door to the issues that would later come. Unbeknownst to us, all aboard was slowly being taken over by a guy who was the living embodiment of Barney Fife from the old Andy Griffith show. It's a classic story. Older guy, nothing better to do. Busybody control freak, he gets on the board and everybody watch out now. There's a new sheriff in town who's going to clean this place up. Hilarity, or is it headaches, follow. He initially got on the board because he ran uncontested and seemed to think that he was appointed dictator of the community. So, McFife, as I'll refer to him from here on out, is such an unpleasant disagreeable butt to deal with that one by one, as board members' terms came up, they simply didn't run again because they had had it just dealing with him. This allowed him to replace them with his hand-picked puppets who did whatever he told them to do. Once he had full control of the board, McFive went wild. They started fining people for things that weren't actually prohibited, refused to grant anyone a hearing with the board, and simply ignored the bylaws and state law regarding the fine process. The typical scenario went like this. They would send out a violation letter, and if you didn't do what they wanted within a week, the fines would start rolling in on a weekly basis, increasing in dollar amount each time, with veiled threats of foreclosure soon to follow, even though you cannot foreclose for unpaid fines in Arizona. Now most people were just getting intimidated and folded. When they tried finding us for things that aren't in the CCNRs, I'd finally had enough and called them out on it and let everyone else know what was going on. Their response was to carpet bomb the community with fines, especially the people that they didn't like, while their friends were exempt. The more fines that they sent out, the more people complained. The more people complained, the more fines they sent out. In eight months, they issued five times the number of fines that had been issued for the previous three years combined. The infamous Labor Day lambasting. As was par for the course, they scheduled the next meeting with minimal notice, 16 hours, and on a holiday in hopes that no one would show up. To their surprise, a good 40 homeowners appeared intent on letting the board know just what they thought of their latest antics. At the end of the meeting, each homeowner had two minutes to address the board. It quickly degenerated into 40 minutes of one homeowner after the other, excoriating the board relentlessly. They really had no defense, and the meeting wrapped up with the former board member advising them that if they were unclear as to their duties, that perhaps they should schedule a consultation with the HOA attorney, which they did. The attorney had to spend four hours explaining the CCNRs, the bylaws, and the state law to them because they were incapable of figuring them out for themselves, and ultimately, they had to reverse all of the outstanding fines that they had sent out since they weren't valid. This was all a bit of a setback for McFife, and for a few months, things were pretty quiet. No new fines were coming out, and we all figured that we had reined them in. Little did we know that McFife had other plans. The board was ignoring any and all requests for a hearing after the violation letters went out. One of our neighbors, Mike, after receiving a violation letter, wouldn't give up and continued to send certified letters requesting a hearing, and the board finally relented and scheduled one. When Mike showed up at the appointed time, the only one there was McFive. Since there wasn't a quorum, there was no official hearing. However, McFife offered to give Mike an unofficial hearing anyway. It was my opinion that they did this intentionally as a dry run of sorts to see what Mike's defense would be. Mike, figuring correctly as it turned out that he would never get an actual hearing, decided to play along to see how things would turn out. 
Well, it didn't take long for McFife to start getting the worst of things, as Mike was in the right after all. Mike, who is originally from Poland, speaks English fluently. However, he does have a pronounced accent. McFife started to mock him, imitating his accent and parroted back the things that he was saying. Seeing that nothing useful was going to be accomplished, Mike commented, If this is how you're going to conduct yourself, then I may have to consider consulting with an attorney. At that, McFife slammed his notebook shut and announced, You've just said the magic word. This hearing, that never really was a hearing anyway, is over and stormed out. Mike never did get his official hearing, but after the infamous Labor Day meeting when the board consulted with the HOA attorney, his eventual outstanding fines were removed from his account along with everyone else's. So, after a few months of relative peace, the board was at it again. Here's a highly abbreviated recap of their reign of terror. One of the owners rents out the property, and as the latest tenant just moved out, she was doing some repairs and maintenance. The garage door and the door leading into the house were open as workers were going in and out. One of the board members, clipboard in hand, just walked into the house unannounced and then started dictating to the owner all of the things they wanted done, inside and out. You'll have to remove that tree. Now we don't like that kind. We'll provide you with a list of what we like. In fact, we really don't like the way your yard is landscaped at all. We want you to redo the whole yard. Oh, and here's what we want you to do inside. They're lucky the owner didn't tell them to shove their clipboard up their butt. One of the other owners was having landscaping done in her backyard. The board demanded access to her yard so that they could see what she was doing, which they have no authority to do. She's originally from NYC and doesn't put up with any crap and told them to go screw off. Her property backs up to the common area, and later on, she caught them standing at her back wall, looking over into her yard. The north side common area is on a very busy street. This stretch had an abundance of well-established trees that had been there for over 30 years that acted as a natural sound barrier and a privacy wall. Well, in a stroke of brilliance to save money, the board decided to turn all the water off for the summer, which is regularly 100 plus degrees here in Arizona. None too surprisingly, probably 60% of the trees just died. So now they say, oh, we have to cut down the dead trees. But not only that, they decide to go one step further. The residents whose property backs up there had gotten into it with the board for shutting off the water in the first place. So, as retaliation, they not only had the dead trees cut down, but every live tree that was the opposite the backyards of the homeowners that complained. So many homeowners protested about the trees being cut down that they begrudgingly planted a handful of new trees. Well, six months later, they got mad at certain residents again, and as punishment, they went through and cut down every one of the new trees that they had just planted. Of course, the homeowners whose property backs up here again complained vigorously. A year and a half later, they still hadn't planted any new trees, given the residents any idea if or when they planned on putting any new trees in and couldn't or wouldn't give any kind of coherent explanation as to why they cut down the newly planted trees and live trees to begin with. McFife and his minions also weren't all that fond of what they considered non-whites either. This is what happens when those people move into a community. I also personally overheard him making anti-Semitic comments after one of the meetings directed at a friend of ours. Once after one of the meetings, my wife heard McFife fuming to the other board members. These people are going to have to learn to do as I say. Anyone who doesn't follow my rules and do what I tell them to do, when I tell them to do it, will be punished. They started hiring a uniformed police officer at 180 bucks more wasted money to attend the meetings specifically to throw anyone out who dared ask a question that they didn't like. Someone would ask a question that they couldn't or wouldn't answer and their response would be, ah, oh, we're not going to answer that at the current time. Or they would give a complete non-answer and then want to move on. Here's a typical exchange. Homeowner would ask a question that they didn't like board would refuse to answer or give a non-answer and then say, we're going to move on. The homeowner would say, but you didn't answer the question. The board would say, one more word out of you and we'll have the officer throw you out. A friend of ours was the only person actually ever thrown out because her response was, oh, so you either can't or won't answer the question, which is it? 
The president just blew up, shouting, That's it, you're out. Officer, get her out of here now. Out, get out, get out now. Our friend and the cop were laughing as he led her away. He followed them out into the hallway, yelling the whole time. That was the beginning of the end for them. People who had shown up to the meeting saying that they wanted to see for themselves if things were as bad as they were, were saying that they were shaking their heads and looking around in disbelief. And then there was the harassment, vandalization, and defamation that was directed towards myself and my wife that started after the infamous Labor Day meeting. It was well known that I was the one that alerted the neighborhood as to what was going on, so now I was labeled the neighborhood troublemaker. Frequently, someone would steal my garbage cans and take them four blocks away and throw them into a busy street. The president of the HOA's kid wailed a big rock at my house. I heard it hit and had two witnesses, and I had to file a police report. The security lights on the side of my property were damaged. Someone, take a guess who, filed an anonymous complaint with the city saying that my property had dead trees and an accumulation of garbage violating the city codes for blight. Of course, none of this was true, and the city inspector came by and promptly closed the case, as my property wasn't in violation of any city codes or any of the community CCNRs, which is why they couldn't find me for anything, which frustrated them to no end. And then there were the monthly newsletters, where we were specifically singled out month after month. They took things out of context, misrepresented others, or just flat out fabricated complete lies. The highlight of all this bullcrap came at the annual meeting, where there I got to be the feature of a 20-minute PowerPoint presentation where they went so far as to take my actual emails, chopped them up, and pieced them together to try to make it look as if I said things that I never did. I would have liked to see him try to defend that one in court. They tried to portray us as the neighborhood crackpot troublemakers who just don't want to follow the rules. We were single-handedly bringing the whole community down, turning it into a ghetto, driving the property values down, and blah blah blah. And this went on. For a full 20 minutes, virtually everything that was presented was willfully distorted and taken out of context. At one point, I had had enough and pointed out that he had misrepresented what I actually said by editing my emails and they threatened to have the cop that they hired for the occasion, who would be a regular attendee from this point on, to throw me out. It was difficult to keep from going off on them, but I had to because I was looking at the long game, which was to get them removed. Getting into a big argument with them and getting thrown out would have been counterproductive to that end because there were still a lot of people who really didn't know the full story. After they had their say, I nailed them to the wall because I had concrete proof of them falsifying meeting minutes and the election results and handed out copies to everyone in attendance which laid the groundwork for their eventual downfall. After I revealed that the board had been falsifying meeting minutes and election results combined with their behavior at the annual meeting, their reputation in the community was at an all-time low. So for a few months, once again, things were relatively quiet. A few months later, we all received a rather large package in the mail from Star Management Company. Since the HOA only has 99 houses and very little common area, we had been self-managed, so none of us knew who Star Management was. Well, it appeared that the HOA had decided to hire a management company without telling anyone. After talking about the new management company, there followed several pages of new architectural guidelines. When built, the only color option was white. Over the years, this has been expanded to include various shades of tan and brown, but McFife was now paring back the choices with the goal of eventually returning to only white. And then what followed was 15 pages of newly created use restriction after use restriction after use restriction. The new rules that they had just made up micromanaged every single aspect of your property, front and back and what you can have inside your garage, how long you can leave your garage door open, and they were trying to dictate the inside of the house too. Essentially, these are the CCNRs that our very own version of Barney Fife wishes that he had at his disposal, but since they didn't exist, he just created them up entirely out of thin air. 
Needless to say, several of us were on the phone to an attorney the very next day. The two attorneys that reviewed the documents were literally laughing and shaking their heads as they read it. They stated that either they just manufactured this themselves, or if they paid someone for this, they need to ask for their money back. The guidelines were so vague and flexible that it gave the board the ability to fine anyone for anything at any time they wanted to, at their discretion. The interpretations could vary from year to year and member to member, depending on the whims of the then current board leaving the homeowners in the dark as to whether they were in violation of any given rule, until they start receiving violation letters. And then, who knows, maybe the next board will interpret it differently. Fully 90% of the houses were in violation of something under the new rules. Most houses had multiple violations. Many of the rules were specifically crafted to target certain people in the community that they didn't like. There were at least three rules that were created just for me. As written and ratified in our attorney's opinion, if they actually attempted to enforce most of this, they would have been opening themselves up for repeated lawsuits. In addition, the management company wasn't even going to be handling the billing. They were specifically hired by the board for the purpose of enforcing their new rules and assessing fines because they didn't have the guts to face the homeowners themselves. We all knew that they were going to be providing them with the hit list of the people that they wanted to go after while their friends and neighbors would remain exempt because that was consistent with their previous track record and there was nothing to indicate that this would change. Word of what they had done spread like wildfire. I had furious people stopping me in the street, emailing and calling, showing up at the front door, all saying similar things. Who the heck do these people think they are, and what can we do about it? If these were the rules that were in effect when I looked at this house, I never would have bought it. I would have told the agent to keep looking. I won't live under this bullcrap. I'll move first. An open meeting was scheduled a few weeks out, and we were all anticipating exactly what would transpire. At one point during this whole ordeal, I started receiving violation notices and fines for things that weren't actually prohibited in the CCNRs. I openly challenged them to show me the article in the section of the CCNRs that I was in violation of, and that if they could, that not only would I comply with their demands and pay their fines, but would apologize too. I knew full well that they couldn't because they were just making things up as they went. McFive's favorite canned response was, This is not up for discussion. The fines will continue at weekly intervals. We look forward to your compliance. In other words, why can't you just shut the heck up and pay the fines because we tell you to just like everyone else has been doing? Well, I told them to feel free to keep sending them and I'll just continue to ignore them. They ended up hitting something like $600 plus before they finally realized that I wasn't going to comply or pay the fines. In Arizona, they can't foreclose for unpaid fines and can't apply your association payments to outstanding fines without your permission. They would have had to take me to court, and they didn't have a case which I openly told them. They didn't believe me, of course, but ultimately, after consulting with the HOA attorney, they found out that I was in fact, correct, and one day all of my outstanding fines disappeared from my account. In 19 years of living in two different HOAs, I never did pay so much as one dollar in fines. The Open Board Meeting The board, the new management company that they had just hired to enforce all of the fines that they had planned on sending out, that they hired without our knowledge, and the HOA attorney, well, they also had a cop there as well, were all there in addition to at least 25 homeowners. As unhappy as the majority of the homeowners in attendance were, they were overall pretty respectful and reasonable. The board, their attorney, and the management company, on the other hand, came off terribly. They were confrontational, arrogant, evasive, dismissive, and right from the start, clearly adopted an adversarial us-versus-them mentality. We really didn't have to say very much because their own words and demeanor turned more people against them than anything that we could have said would. The first step towards removing the board is to have a petition signed by 25% of the homeowners calling for their removal, so 25 people in our case. We already had the petitions prepared and in the hallway after the meeting we had furious people lining up and jostling for position to sign it. 
there were people in attendance who have never been to a board meeting in the 20 to 30 years that they've lived here, who showed up completely outraged by what's been transpiring. Of the five board members, one of our neighbors was the only nice and reasonable one. One of our friends pulled her aside after the meeting and asked her if she was in agreement with what was going on, and she said, no, I'm not any happier about this than you are. Our friend asked her why she was even on the board if she didn't have the spine to voice her opinion, and if she was just going to vote whichever way that she was told to by McFife, well, she may as well just resign. One of the homeowners does the bookkeeping, gets paid 6000 bucks a year for it too. He showed up late from work, was visibly angry, asked a few questions, and was blown off by the board and stormed out. My wife caught him outside, and he was the first to sign the petition for their removal. Off the top of my head, of the 25 residents in attendance, we obtained 22 signatures, not counting the board, of course. The problem was that we knew for a fact that they would try to rig the election by stuffing the ballot box, making ballots disappear, and try to schedule the meetings and subsequent election on a holiday to try to prevent us from getting the 20 attendees needed for a quorum for the removal of the board and so on to show you how out of control this is. The state law is that you have 21 days to contact the board to appeal a violation notice. They changed it to five days from the date of the violation. You actually have five days to contact them by certified mail, minus however long it took you to get the violation letter. So basically, they've all but eliminated the appeal process. It would seem to me, that even if you were legitimately in violation of something, if they refused you a hearing because it took you seven days to contact them, that they would be in violation of the state law and that you could get off on a technicality. They couldn't or wouldn't give a straight answer to anything. The lawyer frequently got up and pontificated at length, deflecting the question by droning on and on about something else. When asked about the questionable five-day appeal process or asked direct questions about the ludicrous new use restrictions and how they were going to enforce them, they gave vague wishy-washy answers like, well, we'll consider it case by case. It's a living document subject to amending at any given time. We can't answer that. We'll have to play it by ear and blah, blah, blah. In other words, we're just going to make it up as we go. Days after the meeting, when they found out that a petition was being circulated, they released another of their infamous newsletters, which previously had been used as a sounding board by them to personally attack us for nine months straight. It quickly degenerated into a five-page hysterical rant as they became more and more unhinged, which only confirmed everything that we had been telling people for the previous nine months. They carried on about how every board before they took over was derelict and incompetent. The community was spiraling into the toilet, and they heroically rode in and saved the day for us all. How this community survived for over 30 years without them, we'll never know. Our attorney described it as sanctimonious. They also featured my wife and I in another of their near-monthly personal attacks, essentially painting us out as absentee owners who have literally not done any maintenance to the property in a decade. Of course, none of these allegations have any basis in reality. Things ran far better under the previous boards, and we personally put in a good 50000 bucks into improvements to the property since we owned it, and had never paid a single penny in fines in 20 years of living in an HOA. The only reason that we didn't file a civil suit for defamation and harassment, as it would have been counterproductive to do so at the time, as the main goal was getting them removed. We eventually ended up getting 55 signatures out of 99 houses, well over the minimum 25 that we needed. The one reasonable board member that we knew resigned over the whole situation. The homeowner who has been doing the bookkeeping resigned, and the management company that they had hired won it out too. One of our friends called the management company. They told her that they didn't feel that they, the board, had been honest with them. And when they saw that a large percentage of the homeowners were furious with the board, they wanted out. The board was required by law to schedule a meeting where we would be voting to determine on whether or not the remaining four board members would be removed or not. The board took a business-as-usual position and just stuck their heads in the sand trying to act as if nothing was going on. 
we anticipated that they would try to push the meeting and vote out as long as possible and hope that things cool down, people go out of town for the summer, and so on, and that maybe they can manage to avoid being removed if apathy sets in and people won't show up to the meeting or bother to vote. We also knew that this was really only a short-term solution that basically just kicked the problem down the road for someone else to deal with later. Once things settle down, inevitably, homeowner complacency and apathy sets in. People don't go to meetings, they don't vote in board elections, they won't run for the board, and eventually, the same idiots will get back on the board the same way that they got on in the first place. They'll run uncontested. But in the short term, we still live there, and just trying to sell our house with these new rules in effect would make it more difficult. Early on, our attorney tried to reason with the board and their attorney, and they basically told us to go screw off and challenged us to take them to court, not considering that we could just go the recall route and get them all removed. I did a search on the attorney that the board was using, and I found at least four articles where she had represented an HOA board against a lawsuit by the homeowners, so this is just what she does. After it all hit the fan, she lied to her boss in an email that I saw, trying to cover her tracks and claim that she wasn't kept informed of what the old board had been up to. And the problem is that we had her on tape at one of the meetings preaching at length, basically telling us and the board that this was just a dictatorship and that they had the power to just make up whatever they wanted and there wasn't anything that we could do about it. How wrong they later found out that they were. They're lucky that it did not end up in court. We had concrete proof of the attorney's lies and of the board committing fraud and falsified meeting minutes and election results. And they knew that I knew all of the above. And they also knew that we weren't going to back down or go away. So they really had no other option than to just follow through with the recall election. In the weeks leading up to the recall election, they released a few more of their notorious newsletters, the last of which was a four-page tirade filled with the usual personal attacks that I had come to expect on a monthly basis now, along with fear-based attempts to scare people into not removing them by claiming that the community would spiral into the toilet without them to lead us. It was filled with so many half-truths things taken out of context and outright lies that it would take an hour to try and address it all. They were also making highly inflated claims of these legal costs that they claimed that we were causing them to incur. They did, however, rack up $6,000 in legal fees, creating all of the new rules, and then rolled up another four grand plus in legal fees, fighting tooth and nail not to get thrown out. Later on, after McFife was removed, he caused the HOA to incur an additional two grand or more in legal fees because he kept sending threatening letters to the new board members' houses and the management company. The HOA attorney putting up a website, sending out flyers to the whole community with pictures of all the things he didn't like and so on. They were doing exactly what I expected of them, reacting like children having a tantrum. They decided to go out kicking and screaming, racking up bills that the budget couldn't afford, all to pursue their personal agenda and to maintain their position on the board at any and all cost. They never showed up to the recall election and the attorney and staff ran things. As expected, they tried to rig the election with bogus mail in ballots. It wasn't too hard to figure out about a half a dozen or so snowbirds, absentee owners, and so on who were almost certainly out of town and not likely to show up or vote. We also knew that it wouldn't do them any good. In the end, it didn't matter. The four of them lost by a landslide and were removed. An election was scheduled to appoint a new board. The conclusion of the meeting was pretty funny because I happened to be standing by the exit door and everyone wanted to shake my hand on the way out like it was a receiving line. At least half a dozen people came up afterwards and said that they wanted to personally thank me for all the time and the hard work that I put in to get this done, which I appreciated. We anticipated that the now former board members would still try to find some way that they could contest the results, but they never did as they have no legal basis on which they could. A new board was elected after the recall. McFife attempted to run even though he was just thrown out and wasn't eligible. 
To add insult to injury, my wife got elected and, by accident or design, she had the honor at the next board meeting of detailing to everyone how all of the crazy rules that the old board dreamt up had been removed. Among the many things wrong with what they did, the old board essentially committed fraud with the paperwork that had been filed. At the first meeting of the new board, the new HOA attorney stated that it was virtually unheard of for two people to get an entire board removed, and that it must have been a lot of work. No crap, it cost us at least five grand in legal fees, and at times I was devoting 25 to 30 hours a week on it. In the following months, McFife seemed to become more and more unhinged. He started sending threatening and harassing letters to the board members' homes, the management company, and the HOA attorney. The attorney dealt with him, but when he didn't get what he wanted, his crazy rules reinstated, he completely lost it. He and his wife started regularly patrolling the neighborhood, clipboards and cameras in hand. We still hadn't sold our old house yet, and at one point, our agent got a call from an agent that had just tried to show the house. Apparently, McFife confronted them and the potential buyers in our driveway, telling them, if you buy this house, you had better maintain it the way I like. The previous owners have been warned repeatedly, and now so have you. Needless to say, it did not give the buyers the best impression of the neighborhood. I had to email him and I told him that if I got another call that the agents and buyers were being harassed that I would call our attorney and have a restraining order taken out against him and that seemed to put an end to it. Everyone was wondering what he was up to but for the most part just ignored him. A few months later he was at it again, this time sending out a multi-page tirade filled with wild claims, conspiracy theories concerning the new board. He was demanding that his rules be put back into place, claimed that he had been defamed and he was now expecting an apology, posted pictures of all the houses that they didn't approve of, claimed that the whole place was spiraling down the toilet since they were removed and was on the verge of becoming a ghetto and that only by reinstating his rules and the old board would they be able to bring it back from the abyss. In addition, he also claimed that every previous board was derelict in their duties and only he and his minions knew what was best for the community. He went so far as to put up a website dedicated to this insanity. It looked a bit like the old TimeCube website, all different types of fonts of various colors and sizes. McFife was strutting around the neighborhood, extraordinarily pleased with himself as if he had actually accomplished something significant. The rest of the neighborhood was not so impressed or pleased with it all, particularly the homeowners whose houses were photographed and featured in his newsletter and website. To illustrate the level of dishonesty going on, one of the residents had a flat tire and jacked up the car to put a spare on. McFife photographed the guitar on the jack and featured it to try to make it look as if it had been that way for months. The next board meeting was coming up and I think that he had the idea that he was going to turn the community against the new board, but what he got was a room full of angry people who specifically showed up so that they could yell at him. Another of the former board members almost got into a fight at the end of the meeting with one of the other homeowners. For his part, McFive slunk out at the end of the meeting, getting cursed at by some of the residents as he left. His website wasn't up for very long because the dummy posted videos that he had taken of the last few board meetings online without permission, so we were able to get his domain name taken away. But you apparently can't keep a good kook down because McFife was undeterred and he and one of his minions ran for the board again at the next election. Out of the 30 votes cast, he and his puppet only received 3 votes. He pretty much dug his own grave with that last newsletter and the website. What little support he may have had was now gone, and he and his wife were officially the pariahs of the neighborhood. At the end of the meeting, he got up with a prepared statement that he had copies of for anyone who wanted it, and my wife had had enough and wasn't going to be subjected to any more of this nuts rambling, so she just got up and said, that's it, I'm officially done with this, and walked out since her duties as secretary were over. Of course, I don't doubt that he'll try again next year, but it's no longer our problem since we did finally sell our old house.
Now there are a few acts of rebellion that we partook in while we were fighting with the board before we were able to get them removed that you might find amusing. See, my wife's grandfather had served in World War II and was at Normandy on D-Day. She's fairly artistic, so she made a pretty good-sized American flag with a passage from the Declaration of Independence on it, and we hung it up on the side of the house on Memorial Day. Predictably, we got hammered for it in the monthly newsletter, but once a few people pointed out to the board what it was and why we put it up, they backed off and let it rest. Irritated at the constant monthly personal attacks directed at us in the board's newsletters, one day, my wife bought a large box of plastic pink flamingos. Every time that the board did something that ticked her off, up would go another flamingo. Predictably, we got slammed in the newsletters for that too, but since it wasn't prohibited, there was nothing they could cite us for. Taking matters into their own hands, McFife and Minions started sneaking onto the property at night in order to steal them, so I ended up having to put them places where they couldn't get at them, like up in trees or on the roof. When some of our neighbors asked us what the deal was with the flamingos, they liked it so much that they wanted some for their yards too. I think that we ended up with about six other houses that put one up as a show of solidarity and defiance of the board. At one point, the board was aggressively pursuing landscaping violations. Some were actually legitimate, but many were not. The problem was that at the entrance to the community, there were foot-high weeds and a three-foot-tall dead bush in the common area. This drew a lot of homeowners' complaints because the common response was, you're hassling me, but you guys can't even maintain the common areas yourselves. I emailed them that it made quite the statement about the community to visitors when this was the first thing that they saw when driving up. One day, the landscapers came and went, and while they did take care of the weeds, the dead bush still remained, just where it had stood every bit as dead as it had been for the last year. I thought about just walking down and taking it out myself, but was legitimately concerned that if I did that, they might try to accuse me of vandalizing the common area. We happened to be cleaning out my in-law's garage for them, and I came across a 50-year-old box of old ratty-looking Christmas tree garland, so I used it to decorate the dead bush. Even better, this was in the middle of summer in Arizona, so it looked even more ridiculous. It was the hit of the neighborhood, with everyone, except the board members, of course. When the board saw it, they took the garland down, but a week later, the dead bush was still there, so I went back and redecorated it, this time blanketing it with so much that there was no way to get it all off. This finally got them to have it removed entirely. I'm convinced that if I hadn't done this, that it would still have been there almost a year later when we were finally able to get them all removed. Needless to say, my experiences living in HOAs were not positive ones. Board positions are a magnet for every little would-be dictator to live out their fantasies to abuse their power. HOAs also seem to bring out the worst in human nature. I think the way that my wife described it was petty judgmental bickering. In our case, the board's attitude was, only we know what is best for the community. You people are too stupid to know what's good for you. Just give us your money, shut the heck up, and just do as you're told. They convince themselves that they are in the right, and so, like religious zealots, any action is justifiable because to them, the ends justify the means. The nexus of all the issues came down to McFife. His minions were incapable of really accomplishing anything on their own and simply just followed his directives. The guy genuinely has something wrong with him mentally. He goes through life bullying, blustering, conning, and intimidating people into doing what he wants. He goes around with an arrogant air of superiority as if he knows it all and is the smartest person in the room when the reality is he may very well be the dumbest. But he's able to con a lot of people because they think he seems pretty confident and acts like he really knows what he's doing. If you call him out and stand up to him, he has no answer because he really doesn't know what he's doing and doesn't understand what you're saying. When I quoted the bylaws, CCNRs, and state statutes, pointing out that what he was doing was invalid, he just shut down and his answer was, this is not up for discussion. In other words, why can't you just shut up and do what I say like everyone else does? He's so arrogant and out of control that at one point, he was actually trying to argue HOA law with the HOA attorney. 
Once he got booted from the board and he lost his power base, watching him have a meltdown was like watching someone with OCD who can't perform their rituals. The guy seemed to totally lose it. It had nothing to do with doing what is best for the community. Ultimately, it was all about feeding their egos, abusing their power, and controlling, dominating, and micromanaging the lives and the property of everyone in the community. This guy and his minions will continue to be a nuisance for everyone living there for years to come. Once we moved, I figured that was the last that I would hear about the old HOA. Well, six months later, I got an email from one of our old neighbors. He wanted the name of the HOA attorney that we had to hire to help us oust the old board before we moved. Apparently, according to him, the new board was now slowly starting to resemble the old one. New rules, new fines, selective enforcement, holding meetings with the minimum of notice to the community in hope that no one will show up, creatively manipulating the rules to serve their own personal agenda, and so on. He feels that it's going to blow up again and eventually end up in court, so he figures that he better get in touch with an attorney sooner rather than later. This current situation doesn't surprise me at all and was part of the reason that we moved. I was concerned that once a new board took control, that eventually, down the road, it was just going to be more of the same. I was already beginning to hear rumors and grumblings of discontent just before we sold. I'm convinced that some of these people will never be happy with any board that's elected over there. The only board that they would be happy with is the one that they are president of, and even then, they would complain about all of the work that they had to do. New people get on the board, they've each got their own agendas, personal grudges, pet peeves, and so on. They let the position go to their heads, and before long, they set about fixing things and want to rule over the community with an iron fist, because a dictatorship is okay as long as you're the one in control. The more things change, the more they stay the same in HOA land. It's a broken system, a failed experiment, and further confirmation of the Petri dish principle that I posted about earlier. If years ago I knew what I knew now about HOAs, I never would have bought a house in one. Screw HOAs, never again. An update, just yesterday I heard from some of our old neighbors. Apparently, McFife, frustrated at the fact that he and any of his minions have been unable to get back on the board, has just put his protest website back up, but at least this time he was smart enough to be a bit more low-key than off-the-wall lunacy that he had up before. Back when we still lived there, McFife moved his office into the vacant office space next door to the management company so that he could spy on them. My wife was on the board and said that she was sure that he was listening in on the management company because he was addressing things in meetings that she had talked to them about on the phone, so how else could he know any of this? People thought that she was just being paranoid. But apparently not, because since then, the management company has had to install a noise-canceling device in their office. And now, the latest is that he cost them 1800 bucks last year in legal fees trying to sue the management company and the board. Somehow, I'm not missing any of this. And oh yeah, one more thing. Screw HOAs. How would you handle these worst HOA neighbors ever? This post is by Sensitive Ad 1896 I lived in the same HOA off and on in my 20s and early 30s. There were three or four streets and probably no more than about 60 houses in the development. It was a zero lot line community and, of course, the very worst of the worst HOA jerks live right next door. I received handwritten complaints inside my mailbox, illegal by the way, on multiple occasions. The ones I remember were about trash cans left out for too long, I was in major depressive states on those occasions, and essentially in order to keep my dog quiet, inside my own house, when I wasn't even there. They would invite themselves over to my front yard to ambush me while outside with, your garage door doesn't need to be up right now, or your front shrubs need to be trimmed, this oleander should never have been planted here. On so many of these occasions, I wanted to tell this jerk where he could stick it, but he was a good 30 years older and so ridiculously entitled. I didn't have the guts and it probably wasn't worth it. At some point, my close family member directly across the street started yelling at them as soon as they stepped foot off the road and onto the front of her property. 
When I left for a few years, the house sat empty while the homeowner, my family member, was in a nursing home and then moved back, things had escalated. Before I had left, these jerks had routinely parked a minivan in their driveway. Then their live-in, 30-something year old adult son got a new car and wanted it more protected, so he made some kind of deal with a woman down the street to use her garage since she didn't need the second parking spot. Fine, cool, I don't care. What I did care about was when they started complaining about cars in my driveway. This wasn't something that I did regularly, but my very close friends ended up in a legitimately unsafe situation where they lived and they came to stay with me while they figured out how to get out of their lease and move. The HOA jerk next door neighbors lost it. They tried to throw the bylaw book at me for having cars stored in the driveway. The cars were being used daily and lots of other people parked in their own driveways consistently. At this point, I went through the bylaws with a fine tooth comb. As it turned out, there was a rule explicitly barring one homeowner from using the garage of another homeowner. Why? I don't know or care. Of course, that was a rule that didn't need to be followed, but our driveway had to be clear, shrubs trimmed to their liking, and trash cans brought in before the garbage truck was off the street. There were a couple short cul-de-sacs in the neighborhood that ran right up to a ravine, so there was no house at the end of these streets. Apparently, these jerks didn't like that a homeowner parked his work-supplied and branded truck on the street at the end of his cul-de-sac. Their first call to complain wasn't to him, wasn't to the HOA, it was to his employer that supplied the truck. These people were ruthless and garbage humans. These are the same neighbors that complained that I didn't pick up my dog's poo in my own front yard. We didn't have any backyards at all, and almost no one had grass in their small side courtyards. They were upset that my 10 pound dog who runs straight out to pee and straight back wasn't on a leash because their dog was aggressive and pulling out at the same time. Because clearly, my dog being on a leash would totally fix that. Once we got a third car and parked it routinely in the driveway, they all completely lost their minds, knocking at all hours to complain while I worked enterprise cells at home, literally peeking over their courtyard wall into my kitchen, making nasty comments to my boss about me, who they went to church with, and calling my parents and other family to complain about me. These same people caused other residents to walk a certain route to avoid going past the jerk's house. It was a quiet neighborhood, so anytime someone had a party, there was a noise complaint and lots of spying on what exactly was occurring, followed by more complaints more often than not. They convinced the HOA that we shouldn't be allowed to attend HOA meetings or use the pool because our names weren't on the deed. This even though we paid all the bills, the taxes, and the HOA fees directly. Eventually, they let me in the meetings, but tried to tell me that I couldn't speak. That didn't last long. And then they tried to not allow me to vote until my father showed up to a meeting to remind them that he owned two properties in the neighborhood by proxy and power of attorney. My final straws were when they had their roof replaced and their roofers entered my courtyard unannounced, seeing me partially clothed in my own kitchen and then trampling my landscaping every day for a week. After that one, I was throwing roofing nails back over their wall and onto their driveway for months. They officially complained to the HOA about a small tree that wasn't trimmed to their liking, so I brought up their son's car in the neighbor's garage and the woman who owned the said garage ended up throwing a tantrum completely with fake tears in my living room because apparently he was paying her and she needed that income. However, it was particularly satisfying when my partner told the next door neighbor that he didn't like the highly pruned style of their front yard and preferred our slightly more wild look. I swear, that man turned as bright red as a fire truck. Almost as red as when we pointed out that the neighborhood really wasn't that nice due to the enormous metal electric towers running down the middle of our street. There were islands in the road to accommodate these huge things that you could hear buzzing even from inside 24-7. About six months before we bought our house and got the heck out of there, I was walking my dog on a leash and she peed in another neighbor's yard on the way by. We turned to continue and I heard a voice say, clean up after the dog. Well, I turned around and there was no one there. 
This woman was yelling at me through her doorbell about non-existent dog poop. I am not proud to say that I saw red and proceeded to read her the riot act into her doorbell and pressing it repeatedly, telling her to come out. She never said another thing, never came out, and I never did see the woman ever. I never did bring up that my awful neighbors had at least two businesses running out of their house, strictly forbade in the bylaws, literally broke into the irrigation system controls to water their yard more on the HOA's dime, or that they had a visible water spigot and hose in their front yard. It just wasn't worth it. Perhaps this was more of a post about bad neighbors, but I will never, ever, as long as I live, own or live in an HOA again. My family is fully out of there now, and no one has anything nice to say about the place. Do you agree with these commenters? On in order to keep the dog quiet inside the own house, commenter says, I didn't need to read past this. How dare someone expect peace in their own home? OP says, Ha, huh, you come to my door and tell me that a 10 pound dog behind the brick walls of my house is disturbing you from inside your bricked house, and I'm gonna laugh while I slam the door in your face. Comment says, can we not compare everyone we don't like to that group? That's super messed up and insensitive. Frankly, you both sound insufferable. What'd you think of this story? Neighbor that's on the HOA board is falsely accusing my family of running a business from home. Recently, my mom and me went to our HOA meeting to discuss the possibility of them allowing us to get a shed, as sheds are currently not allowed in our neighborhood. But there's been talks about changing that rule. Anyways, during the meeting, the former HOA president's husband suddenly, and out of nowhere, asked my mother during the meeting if she was still running a business from home. So my mom asked what he was talking about, as my mother has never run a business from home, to which he replied, Well, early in the morning for years, you guys had a lot of boxes delivered to your home. This was really upsetting, as the multiple boxes we often got delivered to our house were my dad's medical supplies for his dialysis. This was explained to him that he insisted that we were running a business from home, which is against HOA rules. It was crazy. He falsely lamented that we had boxes delivered to our home for about 20 years, which is false, and that my dad was not sick for that long. Mind you, we don't really know this man, nor does he know us, besides the fact that he's our neighbor, and nor did he know my dad. Very audacious. Anyways, this made my mother break down in tears, as he and the neighbors know that my dad passed away from his health issues just last year. This man doesn't know us. When we explained this, he still insisted and said that, May God strike me down if I'm lying, but you all were running a business. We are hurt that someone can say something like this considering it was my dad's medical supplies and what also hurt us is that the other neighbors were at the HOA meeting, they said nothing. It truly caught us off guard as we literally had no prior problems with this man. He also made other speculations in regards as to why we want a shed, stating that he's worried that we allow someone to live in the shed. And when my mom stated that we want a shed to have more storage space, as she previously said in the previous HOA meeting, He's accusing my mom of lying, saying that she said that she wanted a shed for putting away clothes. We don't even care anymore about getting approved for a shed. Mind you, we've only ever gone to these HOA meetings to try to get approved, so we had no idea this guy was an assumptive jerk. Don't think we're going to go to another meeting again, but a part of me wants to continue to go just to make my presence known. You know what happens when you assume, right? This guy should have not just thought he knew everything and checked on it, and then he tried to defend himself when he was just busted out for lying. How would have you handled this jerk? Overly restrictive HOA rules, posted by Bart84. I just bought a car from a woman who lived in a neighborhood where the HOA does not allow auto repairs. I wanted to install brackets on the front bumper of the car so I can tow it with my truck using a flat tow bar without having to use a dolly or a trailer. But I had difficulty that day cutting the metal bumper, so I told her that I needed to get the dolly after all, but the rental place wasn't open until 7am the next day. She flipped out and threatened to call someone to tow it if I didn't get rid of the car by 8am. I ultimately removed the car using a dolly that next morning, which in hindsight was a much more convenient option anyway. But what shocked me and opened my eyes is how restrictive this neighborhood is. It seems to be an upper class suburb and residents are very aware of everything that goes on and will complain at the smallest hint of something that they don't like. 
What I was doing wasn't a repair, but an addition of a feature to a car. I guess that nuance can easily be missed. But I found out that the HOA already threatened to fine her that morning, probably because one or more of the neighbors complained. Either that, or she made it up to pressure me to remove the car ASAP because she didn't trust that I would keep my word. Regardless, I realized that I would never want to live in a neighborhood where neighbors are watching your every move and ready to report a complaint to the HOA at the first hint of something that they don't like. I can see the value in these rules because it ensures a good looking and crime free neighborhood. But oh my goodness, I would never feel comfortable living in such a place. I live in a downtown area where none of this is a concern. I can fix my car in the street as people do all the time and not get any negative feedback. I plan to move to a house with more land and a garage for me to do auto work as I please anyway, but I never knew these restrictive neighborhoods existed. It taught me a lesson to choose wisely the next area I move into. Do you agree with this commenter or are they wrong? Some HOAs are crazy, many are not. Yes, you should be careful about what the CCNRs are of the area in which you're viewing homes. What do you think? Home accidentally excluded from the HOA by Royal Nublet. My wife and I recently moved into a new build and we received a letter saying that our home was excluded from the HOA by mistake. The letter asked us to voluntarily join but didn't really say anything beyond that. As it turns out, an entire section of the neighborhood was accidentally excluded from the HOA, roughly 25%. I guess the covenants weren't attached to the homes before they were sold or something like that. All of the homes, including ours, were originally intended to be in the HOA, so we were just going to sign up anyway because we were already planning to be a part of it. However, once I find out how many homes surrounding ours also weren't in the HOA, I started having doubts. We're pretty much right in the middle of the no HOA homes, so my concern is that if we sign up, we'd be subjecting ourselves to enforceable rules that many of our neighbors wouldn't be subjected to. So far, only five of those homes have voluntarily joined. I realize the benefits of an HOA with helping to keep your neighborhood nice and funding improvements and whatnot, but then I've also heard stories of how they recently approved someone's paint color and then tried fighting it after it was painted because they didn't agree with the shade of the color they approved. That's the kind of pettiness that I don't want to subject ourselves to if our immediate neighbor can do the same exact thing with no repercussions. What to do? Has anyone else experienced this type of thing? An update. We're going to wait it out and not willingly join. If it comes to being forced to join somehow, then yeah, so be it. But yes, it does not make sense to willingly give up some rights just for the sake of joining with no benefits to it. It doesn't provide any benefits like mowing or trash or anything else like that. We'll just be good and mindful neighbors, as we usually are, and hopefully have no problems. We're even willing to make donations to the community fund and whatnot. For the most part, it seems like the current HOA board is hands off and may just let you be, but like many have said on here, board members change and it only takes one to muck things up. There's no telling what the future board will be like or what changes they'll propose. This commenter says, Dear HOA, LOL, no. Nice. HOA has $300,000 in reserves and isn't improving the neighborhood. Thoughts? Posted by Varen129. I'm a recent first time homeowner in a fairly rural neighborhood as of January 2022, and I'm new to dealing with homeowners associations. Mine is behaving in a way that's left me frustrated with how they seem to be managing the yearly payments that we give them. But because I have no prior frame of reference for what's reasonable, I wanted to hear from people with more experience than I have. We pay our HOA 600 bucks each year, and at today's meeting, they revealed they have over $300,000 in reserve accounts, comprised entirely of yearly HOA fees. They've accumulated so much that they've actually opened investment accounts for it. I recognize that an HOA will want to have some reserves on hand in case of an emergency, and I'm not opposed to HOAs in general, but the amount at issue here seems excessive. There are also a number of neighborhood improvements that seem like they should have been done before the HOA started to invest the money. To give a few examples, our neighborhood runs on well water, and if the power were to go out for a long period of time, there's no generator on the pump that would allow homes in the neighborhood to keep running water. Grass in the common areas is only mowed a few times a year, and not always completely. 
There's a large field in our neighborhood where the grass is routinely allowed to grow over a foot in length without being mowed for long periods of time. Ticks are a big problem here. There's a retention pond near our home that's been broken for a long time due to a mechanical failure, causing the water level to significantly drop. People who bought their homes expecting something near water have also been disappointed. Instead of hiring an engineer, HOA leadership felt that they could fix it personally as a DIY project with rocks and concrete, which, of course, did not fix the issue. Before I consider doing anything else, I just want someone to tell me whether I'm being reasonable. I generally try pretty hard to view people in a good light, but this just seems like a very lazy and conceited HOA. If they have such a large surplus and they aren't using it for anything, the least they could do is suspend our yearly payment. On the other hand, if this is basically par for the course with HOAs, maybe I'm the one who's wrong. Commenter drops this answer. This is the right answer. Not for emergencies, not surplus. It is money set aside to replace existing components, not to perform routine maintenance. Do you agree? What's being coerced into maintaining common area landscaping by CEH Parrot. Less than a year into the new home, there has been a couple interactions with neighbors or the developer over a section of grass between a sidewalk and the street. At first, we were led to believe that was our grass and responsibility. Okay, so we mow and we weed eat it. One night after weed eating, I leave and I notice someone with a blower is blowing my area that I left some trimmings on the sidewalk. Okay, I get it. That should be kept clean. I find it kind of weird that they felt the need to do that, but uh, okay. Today I weed eat the section by the street and then I run to the store. Afterwards I need to blow it off still, but I'll do it when I get back. I am pulling out of my driveway and some guy in a truck stops in the street. He backs up and he rolls his window down to start literally yelling about the grass and the trimmings that need to be blown. I just say, yes, yes, I'll blow it away, and he yells, we have an HOA. His tone was pretty negative the entire time. Not the way you'd expect a stranger to speak to another stranger. Well, he doesn't even appear to live on my street. So this interaction rubs me the wrong way. I come back, I pull up the HOA regulations filed with the county, and I proceed to scour the sections about the common area and the owner landscaping responsibilities. Come to find out, the area in question is most definitely a common area, as defined in Article 1, Section D, and is to be maintained by the association, as defined in Article 1, Section E, and Article 4, Subsection 5. So I get it, that area is a common area. It should be clean and maintained professionally, as mandated in the HOA regulations. I'll leave it for the professionals. My mistake. Maybe I should send them a bill for 125% of my labor. I mean, they would send me one if I was in violation of my landscaping and they had to maintain it. Commenter says, don't give them the idea to fine you for doing unauthorized mowing and so on in a public area. And OP replies, touche. Yeah, don't give them any extra power over you because as we all know, HOAs never abuse their power, right? 